Hi, everyone. My name is James Densley. I am a professor of criminal justice at Metro State University in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm also the co-founder of The Violence Project, which is best known for its mass shooter database. And I'm the co-author of the book, also titled The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic. The database and the book are a research project I've been engaged in over the last five years. With my research colleague, Gillian Peterson, we have interviewed incarcerated mass shooters. We've interviewed the people that knew them, their friends and family. We've interviewed victims' families from mass shootings. We've interviewed survivors of mass shootings and first responders. And we've spent time in the communities where these terrible tragedies have occurred. And at the same time, we've built a database of anyone that killed four or more people in a public space since 1966. Over 180 cases are in that database. And we've done all this to try and better understand the phenomena of mass shootings in the United States so that we can use evidence-based, data-informed decision-making to come towards solutions for policy and for practice that can hopefully end gun violence in America. Now, in a previous life, I used to be a school teacher. Uh, I'm a sociologist by training. I am now a college professor. And so I want to use that context to really state that I'm not coming at this as a partisan issue. I'm genuinely just here to share some of the data that we've collected, some of the evidence that we've gathered to inform this conversation and in turn compel our lawmakers to action because the time for that action truly is now. I want to contextualize the work that we've been doing in the realm of mass shootings by actually reading an excerpt from that book, The Violence Project. This is how we begin chapter two. And it really puts a finer point on just how important this conversation and this issue is. So Kathy Whitman was a 23 year old high school biology teacher that's the first name in the victims database of our work. The youngest is Noah Grace Holcomb. She was 18 months old. A homemaker, Louise Von de Clare, was the oldest, aged 98. Professor Lubinescu was 76. An Israeli born in Romania, he survived the Holocaust but he died trying to protect his students at Virginia Tech University. Sergeant First Class Danny Ferguson was 39. He served in Kuwait, Iraq, and Afghanistan, served his country, and died shielding his army colleagues in Texas. Louise Oglesby, 27, was a mother of two. She was studying to become a nurse. Alison Wyatt was six. She wanted to be an artist. Rows of pictures filled her house. Juan P. Rivera Velasquez was 37, and Luis Daniel Conde was 39. They were a hairstylist and a makeup artist, and they owned a salon together. More than 1,200 people are documented has been killed in mass shootings in our database since 1966. If you subtract their ages at death from their life expectancy at birth, they represent nearly 40,000 years of lives lost. They were men and women as diverse as this nation. They were students, teachers, artists, entrepreneurs, 10% were still children. Bright flames extinguished much too soon. This is the huge cost of gun violence in our country. And let us also not forget those who survive these shootings, but forever have invisible scars. They are living day to day with the deadly consequences of gun violence. 
And then there's just the ripple effects. In the course of our research, one of the things that's been astonishing to us is the six degrees of separation from gun violence. So many people who've been touched by these issues, who knew a friend or a family member, a colleague, who was there that day when this terrible thing happened, and the trauma that ripples out across our communities, and it affects us all. We see it on the news, we see it on social media, we are all affected by this. Now, gun violence comes in many forms, and this is important to catch, contextualize too. You have everyday gun homicides in the United States. In the year 2020, gun homicides jumped nearly 35% to the highest level in more than 25 years. And that year on year increase was actually a record historically. The victims of everyday gun violence are often black and brown young people, some of the most vulnerable in our society. At the same time as those 20,000 plus gun homicides, we have 25,000 plus gun suicides. These are people struggling in life. Suicides are deaths of despair. Again, some of the most vulnerable people in our society. We also have domestic gun homicides. The victims of those crimes tend to be women and children. And then we have mass shootings. Mass shootings that can occur in our schools, in our places of worship, in our workplaces, in retail establishments, indiscriminately claiming innocent lives. Gun violence is a social justice issue for all the reasons I've just outlined. It tends to affect the most vulnerable in our society, and that is why it matters. We have to do something about this if we are to help those that need the most help. Now, in our work, we focus on that very narrow piece of that full range of the gun violence that occurs in this country, mass shootings. Mass shootings grab the headlines. They do affect public opinion. They feed into the fear that we have when we're out in public, but they are, in some cases, the smallest form of gun violence. But that doesn't make it insignificant. And I want to highlight that by emphasizing some of the things that we've learned in the course of our research. So what we've done is we've taken a slice of our data. We're going to look at the shootings that have occurred since Columbine, that terrible high school massacre, which was the worst shooting at a school on record at the time back in 1999. And from 1999 to the present day, we have over 100 mass shootings in our database. And if we look at those 100 cases, and then we look at some of the common sense gun safety measures that are currently being discussed in our society, and right now, even in Congress, we could see just what an impact some of these measures could have made. So for instance, Raising the minimum age to purchase certain guns to 21 may have prevented four of the mass shootings in our database. Now, you might be thinking four doesn't seem like a lot, but those four are the shootings in Parkland, Florida, a shooting at a FedEx facility in Indianapolis, the shooting just a few weeks ago in Buffalo, New York, at a supermarket, and most recently in Uvalde. Texas. Expanding background checks to cover private sales likewise could have prevented four of the mass shootings in our database. Encouraging safe storage of firearms, punishing people who'd failed to secure their guns from children or from criminals that shouldn't have access to them in the first place may have prevented 10 mass shootings in our database. These tend to be school shootings, by the way, because by virtue of age, young people generally can't get access to a firearm unless it's left around unsecured at home. So the school shootings in Red Lake, Minnesota, 
Sandy Hook in Connecticut, Marysville in Washington, Santa Fe in Texas, and also a shooting at a community college in Roseburg, Oregon, may have all been prevented just by securely locking up firearms in the home. Banning the sale of large capacity magazines may have prevented or at least limited the lethality of 20 mass shootings in our database. These are some of the deadliest mass shootings on record, including a mass shooting at an El Paso Walmart, a shooting at Pulse nightclub in Florida, and the deadliest mass shooting on record at a country music festival in Las Vegas. Taken together, those four measures, raising the minimum age to purchase to 21, expanding background checks, encouraging safe storage of firearms, and a ban on large capacity magazines could have changed the course of history in 35 mass shootings in our database. That's a third of the episodes in the United States that have occurred since Columbine in our database. Those 35 shootings claimed the lives of 446 people. Now, if you wanna go a little bit further, banning so-called assault weapons. And when I use that terminology, I'm referring to the definition in the federal assault weapons ban, which was in effect from 1994 to 2004. So I'm using exactly that same definition that was in that ban. And if we had banned those same types of weapons, we may have prevented 32 mass shootings. And expanding red flag laws to remove guns from people in crisis may have prevented as many as 61 of the mass shootings after Columbine in our database. You see, what our research is showing us is that the men, and it tends to be men, 98% of the mass shooters in our database are men, who perpetrate mass shootings are in crisis. It's overwhelming their usual coping me mechanisms. They no longer care if they live or die. The mass shooting is intended to be their final act and it's intended to be watched by all. And it's at that time when they're in a crisis and it's noticeable, there's a change in their behavior from their baseline that they go out and purchase these firearms. If you're in crisis, that's not the time to be buying a gun. And that might seem like an obvious statement, but time and time again, we see that in our data which is why something like a red flag law, which is currently being debated right now in Congress, could have saved so many lives if properly implemented, resourced, and enforced. So I wanna make this clear, we're talking of hundreds of lives potentially saved with these very simple measures that have broad support among the American people. I also want to stress something else that's being talked about right now in Congress that's vitally important. It's called the boyfriend loophole. And it's a reference to domestic abusers and their access to firearms. Now we've ran the numbers on this and in our database, if you go back all the way to 1966 to the present day, there are 64 mass shooters. That's 36% of the total 180 who actually had a history of domestic abuse in their backgrounds. 35 of those individuals abused a romantic partner. 15 of them abused another family member and 14 of them abused both a romantic partner and another family member prior to their shooting crime. These types of abuse included physical violence, sexual violence, coercive control and threats, and in 21 of the cases, threats with a deadly weapon. 22 mass shooters in that database, that's 12% of the total 180, killed a romantic partner in the course of their mass shooting crimes. Some targeted their partner in, in a public space like at work, a place of worship, retail or restaurant establishment. Others began their killing spree at home 
and then moved out into the public realm. The key takeaway from all this is that domestic violence can be a precursor to committing a public mass shooting. Domestic abusers should not have access to firearms. And this is where well-enforced red flag laws and other interventions can truly save lives. So again, I want to reiterate a couple of points here as I wrap up. Number one, I'm a professor. I'm not a politician. I'm not in this to be elected or re-elected. I'm speaking directly to the data, to the research, to the evidence. And the evidence is overwhelming that some simple common sense gun safety measures absolutely could have saved lives and could have averted some of these mass shooting tragedies. I also want to stress that mass shootings represent a small percentage of overall gun violence. We have everyday gun homicides. We have domestic homicides. We have gun suicides. Those particular events tend to target, focus the most vulnerable in our society. We're talking about people of color, women, children, people who are in a crisis and are looking to take their own lives. Gun violence is a social justice issue. It's a priority. It needs our attention, it needs our focus. So I hope that this data, this information can help inform the conversation that's going on right now in the public, but also what's going on right now in Congress and with legislatures across the country. The time now really is for action. And a failure to act, by the way, is only going to make this worse. Because history shows us at times when we are frustrated with our institutions, when our institutions feel like they're failing us, or they're fragile, or they're not doing what we've elected them to do, and we're asking them to do, they tend to be contentious and violent times in our history. So this really is the time to act, because if we don't, what message is that sending to all those families, all those victims, all those survivors, the most vulnerable in our society? That message is saying that we don't care. That's only gonna make matters worse. So there has to be action and it has to be data-driven and evidence-based. And hopefully this is the platform upon which that can be built. So again, I just want to say thank you to the organizers for this really important initiative. Thank you to all the contributors. And uh, let's now see if we can get some action. Thank you very much.